Harry Potter has been around for over two and a half decades, which is a statement that makes me feel old just saying it. But there is a reason that people still talk about it, and that's all the lore and tiny points of disagreement that fans around the world have on certain elements of the series. Could Neville be the chosen one? How does the sorting hat work? What's the deal with Slytherin? All these questions are open for interpretation, and yet many, I think, are just completely misunderstood. So I've gathered a list of what I believe to be some of the most misunderstood and overlooked parts of the series, and put them in one convenient iceberg for you. Before we dive into over an hour of Harry Potter lore, consider subscribing to the channel. We've grown a lot in the last few weeks, and I'd love to make it to 10,000 subscribers. Subscribing is free, and it brings you more content straight from the vault. With that, this is the Harry Potter Misconceptions Iceberg Explained. As usual, we'll start things off with level one. Love and Sacrificial Protection. Let's start this iceberg off with what was one of the more divisive topics in my most recent video. In fact, it's what inspired me to make this video. If you hadn't had a chance to watch it, go check it out. Here's the link. Love. The spell that isn't really a spell, but it's kind of a charm, but it isn't a charm that anyone really knows anything about. It's what allowed Harry to survive Voldemort's attempt on his life, thanks to the sacrifice of his mother, Lily. But let's try to understand a little bit more about the magic and how it works. It's clear through deciphering some of J.K. Rowling's writings and interviews that her concept of self-sacrifice and love are also tied to courage and bravery. It's a theme we see often in the series, from the sword of Gryffindor being pulled by Harry as a true Gryffindor, to Dumbledore's wise words, quote, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends, end quote. To Harry's words about the late Severus Snape telling his son, quote, you were named for two headmasters of Hogwarts. One of them was a Slytherin, and he was probably the bravest man I ever knew. End quote. Bravery is a common theme throughout the series. It also seems to be a key component in the love or sacrificial protection charm that Lily Potter places on her son, Harry. When asked specifically about Lily's sacrifice and why Voldemort gave her so many chances, and if he would actually have let her live, here is what J.K. Rowling had to say after a moment of silence. Quote, I can't tell you. But he did offer, you're absolutely right. Don't you want to ask me why James's death didn't protect Lily and Harry? There's your answer. You've just answered your own question. Because she could have lived and chose to die. James was going to be killed anyway. Do you see what I mean? I'm not saying James wasn't ready to. He died trying to protect his family. But he was going to be murdered anyway. He had no... He wasn't given a choice. So he rushed into it in a kind of animal way. I think there are distinctions in courage. James was immensely brave, but the caliber of Lily's bravery, I think in this instance, was higher because she could have saved herself. Now, any mother, any normal mother, would have done what Lily did. So in that sense, her courage too was of an animal quality, but she was given time to choose. James wasn't. It's like an intruder entering your house, isn't it? You would instinctually rush them, but if in cold blood you were told, get out of the way, you know, what would you do? I mean, I don't think any mother would stand aside from her child, but does that answer it? She did very consciously lay down her life. She had a clear choice, end quote. The interviewer presses on, clarifying that James was not given a choice in the same manner as Lily, to which J.K. Rowling says that no, he was not given a clear choice in sacrificing himself. After which the interviewer asks, quote, so no one, Voldemort or anyone using Avada Kedavra ever gave someone a choice and then they took that option to die? J.K. Rowling responds, quote, they may have been given a choice, but not in that particular way, end quote. So I don't know exactly what to make of it. There was a long back and forth in the comments of the last video about whether Neville's parents could have afforded him the same protections if Voldemort went to the Longbottoms instead of the Potters. I tend to think the nature of prophecy and time travel-like topics in Harry Potter are closed loops. Or, in other words, while Alice Longbottom wouldn't have had Snape asking Voldemort to spare her, 
I think Voldemort would have done something equally twisted, like telling her she would be spared if she sacrificed her child and joined him, thus giving Neville the same possibility of being shielded by the charm. But let me know if you've got an opinion here, and let's move on to other topics. Dumbledore's Bond of Blood Okay, so this one is confusing for a couple reasons. First, this topic is kind of brushed over in the movies, or rather swept in together with the sacrificial protection provided by Lily's sacrifice. In reality, it's a sort of extension of Lily's sacrifice, though my understanding is that it's still some kind of unique and separate spell. After Lily's sacrifice, and upon collecting Harry and dropping him off at the Dursleys, Dumbledore casts another spell that essentially extends and protects Harry from Voldemort with the sacrificial protection from Lily as a baseline. The conditions we find out towards the end of the series are that Harry, one, be in proximity of someone that shares blood with the victim, Lily and Petunia Dursley are sisters, two, be in a place that he can call home, which for much of the series is either Dursley's in the summer or Hogwarts during the school year, and three, be under the age of 17. Now, the reason I say that this was a completely separate charm is because J.K. Rowling clearly states that no one knew what Lily Potter did was possible. No one, not Dumbledore, not Voldemort, knew the power encapsulated in a loving, freely chosen sacrifice. So, when Dumbledore casts a spell that lengthens that protection, while it might be a powerful form of ancient magic, I believe it's independent from Lily's form of powerful ancient magic. It was a way to extend some level of protection, and basically to multiply that original protection so long as they agreed to the three principles above. In Harry's case, this was also applied to sacrificial protection, so it stopped Voldemort from ever touching him prior to him coming of age. Further, when Voldemort was resurrected in Goblet of Fire, he did so using some of Harry's blood, which meant that from Goblet of Fire onward, Voldemort also had Harry's blood flowing through his veins, meaning that some of that protection from Lily and Dumbledore's combined efforts was being provided to Harry while he was around Voldemort. I know this is confusing, but to recap, the Bond of Blood was a very powerful piece of possibly ancient magic that seems to extend the protection provided by another spell, including the Sacrificial Protection Charm. What isn't clear is if it only applied to this sacrificial charm, or if it could be applied to other spells and charms, more benign things than protection from murder. What about just general health and well-being? Also, when Dumbledore states that there are conditions that must be met for the protection to be provided, it's not clear if it's an all-or-nothing situation. It seems instead that there are shades of protection provided based on the number of conditions that are met. In other words, when all these three conditions are met, which is essentially only when he's living with the Dursleys before his 17th birthday, that protection from Voldemort is absolute. And that makes sense. It would be the place where Harry would have the least outside protection from Dumbledore and everyone at Hogwarts. When Harry is at Hogwarts during the school year, you could argue that two of those three conditions are still met. He might not be living with Petunia anymore, but he does consider Hogwarts to be his home, and he is, for the most part, under the age of 17. With two of these three conditions met, he appears to be rather well protected, at least from death, but probably not from injury. When only a single condition is met, in other words, when he's in the final book and he's over 17 but still on the grounds of Hogwarts, or when none of the conditions are met, i.e. when he's gallivanting around in the final book looking for horcruxes, is he truly vulnerable? In fact, to steal McGonagall's words, it's only through sheer dumb luck that he even made it to the climactic final duel. Had Voldemort realized any number of errors, the use of Harry's blood to resurrect himself, the limitations of his own wand, or that Harry was the true owner of the Elder Wand, he likely could have dispatched Harry with ease, but that would have been a much, much darker story. The Sorting Hat Let's lighten the mood just a touch. 
The Sorting Hat is likely one of the first memorable parts of Harry Potter for you, next to Hagrid kicking down the Dursley's door, the no post on Sundays scene, and the fantastic wizard chess battle, the Sorting Hat sticks out in my memory as the first thing that made the wizarding world different, or at least different from other magical worlds. This one had charm and life to it, but on top of that, it seems to be full of misunderstandings. It's probably what has led people to continue to discuss the series more than two decades later. That and the unfathomable amount of money that Warner Brothers has pumped into theme parks and movie after movie. Side note, did you know that J.K. Rowling sold the movie rights for the first four books to Warner Brothers for about $2 million? That was a steal. So, The Sorting Hat. I think there's a big misunderstanding over how The Sorting Hat is actually working. Many would suggest that The Hat is sorting young witches and wizards based on their personality traits, No, you're brave and heroic, Gryffindor. You're sneaky and underhanded, Slytherin. You're weird, Hufflepuff. Just kidding, no shame to you Hufflepuffs out there. This is also backed up by the countless sorting hat personality quizzes out there. It seems to be a common understanding that the way you present yourself is the way the sorting hat sorts. But I think that's wrong, and I think there's a small but important distinction to be made. The Sorting Hat does not work on your personality traits, but rather what you value and which house you prefer to be in. Let's look at a few obvious examples. The big one to start with is Harry Potter. The Hat takes some time to deliberate with him. The Sorting Hat says, quote, Hmm, difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes. And a thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. So where shall I put you? To which Harry says, or thinks, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. And the Sorting Hat says, not Slytherin, hey? Are you sure? You could be great, you know. It's all there in your head. And Slytherin would help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. No? Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor. End quote. Now, There is the question of whether the piece of Voldemort inside him was influencing the hat, but that should be an even greater evidence that the hat is not actually choosing, but guiding the student to make their own choice. To say it differently, the purpose of the hat might be to force clarity from the student. You'll never be more clear on your choice until you're forced to face the reality of being sorted into a house you dislike. Let's look at two other examples. First, a quick one. Neville Longbottom, famously the antithesis of courage and bravery, at least in his first year. But that isn't what the hat sees when it sorts him into Gryffindor. It sees a boy that values courage and bravery, and has the capacity for it, not one that is already brave and courageous. And then lastly, do you remember what house Peter Pettigrew was in? You know, the right-hand man of Voldemort? That's right, Gryffindor. Peter Pettigrew is what students would call a true hat stall, a phrase that I had never heard before, but it was essentially just a student that the hat took longer than five minutes to sort. So Peter Pettigrew presented the hat with a true conundrum, trying to determine whether to sort him into Slytherin or Gryffindor. It of course settled on Gryffindor, but that was perhaps only at the prompting of Pettigrew. Perhaps Peter's admiration for James and Sirius is what swayed the hat. To this day, the hat refuses to acknowledge any mistake in sorting students, including Peter Pettigrew. But it does make you think what the story would have been like if Harry had been sorted into Slytherin, doesn't it? Death Eaters Can Fly As far as I can tell, this is a misunderstanding based purely on how the Death Eaters were portrayed in the movies. In fact, flight was said to be an incredibly difficult magical ability to master. Only two individuals were known to have done so, Voldemort and Snape. Every other instance of unsupported flight is either a trick or some type of simplification in the movies. The most common explanation I see about this is that the black smoke that we see the Death Eaters turn into is supposed to be a visual representation of them apparating in and out of spaces, 
which to me seems a little strange, as apparition was always described as an instantaneous process. Someone disapparates somewhere one second and then apparates somewhere the next second. This is also strange because we see other examples of apparition in the series, where the individual basically wraps in upon themselves and disappears. Not with a bunch of smoke, but with a tiny flash of light. So I'm not sure what to think about this one. I don't think that's them apparating. I think it's probably something else. My headcanon on this has always been that when we see the black smoke, the Death Eaters are actually on broomsticks. You just can't see them through the smoke. Maybe I should just leave this as one of those stylistic choices the movie made and not dig any deeper. But I'm curious what you think. And while you think about that, let's move down a little deeper to level two. Muggles don't know about magic. Maybe the most hilarious topic on this list is the idea that muggles don't know about magic. This is perpetuated by the numerous laws and legislation that the Ministry of Magic has in place to keep the wizarding world as secretive as possible. But there is absolutely no way muggles aren't at least somewhat aware of the wizarding world. I mean, not even that long ago, magic and non-magical people lived together. In fact, their separation in society is more of a recent occurrence. Some of this is confirmed in the canon. The Prime Minister is aware of the existence of magic, but officially only in a capacity that aids in the concealment of it from the everyday citizen. But if you look around, how could this realistically be a secret? First and foremost, you have magical children that can be born to two muggle parents. How in the world would that secret not leak out? The canon explanation is that muggles who try to explain magic to their muggle friends would simply look crazy. But have you looked around the world? Obviously, people would believe them. There would be so many corroborating accounts of other parents having sent their children off to a magical school. I think, and this is just conjecture, but maybe every once in a while, the ministry has to do some dirty work, going around and wiping the memories of the most outspoken muggles. Alternatively, maybe they embrace it, going so far as to plant fakes in the crowd. People that would tell crazy stories about wizards that fly around on brooms, but then also talk about how the government is poisoning its people. If you throw in a little bit of gossip that's a bridge too far, no one will believe the wizard stuff to begin with. So part of this is a bit of a misconception. There are obviously muggles that know about the magic and the wizarding world, but I think there's also a bit of a plot hole here where it's kind of something you just overlook in order to suspend your disbelief of Harry Potter and the series. Priori Incantatum and the After Effects Alright, let's dig into the real meat of the misunderstandings and misconceptions in the series. I think this is honestly one of the most confusing parts of the series. Let's talk a little bit more about Priori Incantatum and the after effects that it would have on a wand. Flashback again to the scene at the graveyard in the Goblet of Fire. Cedric Diggory has just been killed, which I think marked a noticeable shift in the tone of the novels and the movies. No longer written exclusively for children, the return of Voldemort suddenly forced all the characters to grow up rather quickly, and the readers with them. Harry is caught in a duel with one of the most powerful wizards of all time, and has somehow held his own as a fourth-year student. Or at least he avoids being murdered immediately which is better than you can probably say for most. So, as Harry bravely takes a stand and fires a spell at Voldemort, Voldemort fires a curse back at Harry, and they meet in the middle. I'll read from the chapter in question. Quote, A jet of green light issued from Voldemort's wand just as a jet of red light blasted from Harry's. They met in midair. And suddenly, Harry's wand was vibrating as though an electric charge was surging through it, his hand seized up around it. He couldn't have released it if he had wanted to, and a narrow beam of light connected the two wands, neither red nor green, but bright, deep gold. He felt his feet lift from the ground. He and Voldemort were both being raised into the air, their wands still connected by that thread of shimmering golden light. End quote. 
So as this connection continues, they sort of battle back and forth, and as I understand it, Harry's will and courage and bravery and all of those magical qualities about Harry essentially allow his wand to be the dominant one and Voldemort's the submissive one. So this forces Voldemort's wand to spit out what are referred to as echoes of past spells. In Voldemort's case, we see the echoes of his victims appear and they aid in Harry's escape. One thing that, to my understanding, is never truly explained is why are these echoes of people distinct from those created by either the Resurrection Stone or the Horcrux in the case of Tom Riddle's diary, which Harry says the echoes from the Resurrection Stone resemble those of the Horcrux. The tricky part is no one besides Harry can see the echoes in the Deathly Hallows, while in the graveyard, those echoes are very much visible to everyone. They help obscure Harry from Voldemort while he escapes. So, are they a distinct kind of spirit, or is this just a case of too many minute details in the books that just got mixed up? Further, an interesting point here that I didn't originally connect when I read the books is that this effect, Priori Incantatum, is actually a pretty common spell. It's used on Harry earlier in the same book to determine if he cast the Dark Mark. It's referred to as Priori Incantato as the spell, but the Incantatum is the effect. It's a spell that presumably would be used all the time in the wizarding justice system to aid in detective work. It just so happens that it's the effect produced by dueling wands that share the same core. Why? I don't know that it's explained past the idea that when those wands duel, the loser will spit out its most recent spells in reverse order. Also, Voldemort seems surprised by the effect, which begs the question, does Priori Incantato or Incantatum, the effect, normally produce an echo of a victim if that user had recently killed someone? I would think that would make for some very open and shut court cases, but for some reason I feel like that phenomenon is unique to the Harry Voldemort duel. It seems instead that the effect of Priori Incantatum is produced by the connection between Harry and Voldemort's wands, but that the underlying magic might be distinct from the actual spell Priori Incantato. I think there is good evidence to believe that there is in fact something distinct and unique happening when Harry and Voldemort's spells connect. First and foremost, because this appears to be the only time in history that it's happened, which to me, it seems like it wouldn't be that unique of an occurrence. Surely other wands were made with identical cores pulled from the same animal. I can imagine a rich family having wands specifically created for their children, all containing cores from the same dragon heart. I mean, honestly, if you go through the trouble of killing a dragon to harvest its organs and turn them into wands, you'd think that a single dragon heart could probably supply the components of at least a handful of wands, right? Which leads me to believe that the connection between the wands might have been more closely tied to the unique relationship that Harry and Voldemort shared as Horcruxer and Horcruxy. Maybe this split soul situation causes some sort of break in the magic of two related wands. Wands essentially seem to be a type of almost living magic. We know that the wand chooses the wizard, so this unique relationship might be even further complicated by Harry being Voldemort's Horcrux. Lastly, when Dumbledore is explaining the Priori Incantatum effect that occurred with Harry, Sirius chimes in, asking if it was the reverse spell technique. I don't think Sirius is claiming to be familiar with the exact things that unfolded between the two wands, but rather just familiarity with the Priori Incantatum effect. In reality, I think everyone is completely surprised by what happened, but did recognize that one effect of the connection was that of Priori Incantatum. That said, the connection also had other effects on the wands. As we fast forward a few years to the Battle of Seven Potters, we see those effects. Voldemort has interrogated Ollivander to understand what happened in the graveyard, but he clearly doesn't know everything either. To avoid a repeat situation, he uses Lucius Malfoy's wand in the attack, hoping to finish off Harry in one swift blow. Unfortunately for him, 
Harry's wand responds as if it were a living being and casts some type of raw magic at Voldemort. Here's the part in the book. Quote, As the pain from Harry's scar forced his eyes shut, his wand acted of its own accord. He felt it drag his hand around like some great magnet, saw a spurt of golden fire through his half-closed eyelids, heard a crack and a scream of fury. End quote. So, even though every wiki describes the meeting of the two brother wands as priori incantatum, it seems that this is a bit of a misnomer and only accounts for one effect of many that surround Harry and Voldemort's wands. But maybe I'm just overthinking it. Let me know your thoughts below, and while you're at it, click that subscribe button. Snape is a good guy. That's a little bit of clickbait. I mean, of course Snape is a quote-unquote good guy, but that goodness only goes as far as to betray Voldemort, so the bar is pretty low. But let's explore a little more deeply. Snape's general character arc is reasonably well known. I think his motivations are often glossed over in favor of the sacrifices that he makes. The sacrifices in the Harry Potter universe tend to be given both extra consideration and accommodation. I mean, think about it. The series itself is bookended by sacrifices from different characters. Lily's sacrifice at the beginning kicks off Harry's mortal battle with Voldemort, both protecting him in some situations, while also being the very thing that's endangering him in the first place. And then, at the end of the series, we have another sacrifice by Harry in order to protect not just the students and faculty of Hogwarts, but the broader wizarding world, and I guess the muggle world by extension. Not only that, but the series is riddled, <clears throat> riddled with sacrifices. And almost every time, that individual that made the sacrifice is hailed as a hero. Albus sacrifices himself to continue his plan, Ron tries to sacrifice himself in the first book, many individuals sacrifice themselves on behalf of protecting Harry, and I think most of their intentions are pure. But then we get to Snape, and I think his sacrifice is worthy of a double take. Does he sacrifice himself, and should he be commended for it? Absolutely. Is he sacrificing himself for the sake of the wizarding world? I'm not so sure. He was, of course, a Death Eater to begin with, and we can argue about redemption all day, but at the end, was Snape doing it for muggle-born wizards, or was he just doing it for Lily? Many will argue that of course he had a redemption arc, that's what J.K. Rowling says is the case, so it must be true. But I would argue that it's up to the readers to determine the true character of Snape. J.K. Rowling can write the plot, but ultimately it's the audience that will judge the characters. So, I guess this one is less of a misconception and more of an opinion, but to me, I've always been a little weirded out by the love for Snape as a good guy. I think he's a well-written character, and I think he makes sacrifices, but I'm not sure that the motivation is quite as pure as others. He was undeniably brave, don't get me wrong. At this point, I'm regretting this topic a little because I'm sure Snape's biggest fans are going to be very upset in the comments, but oh well. Come at me. Hogwarts Acceptance Letters This is an age-old misconception. In fact, I still remember waiting up on my 11th birthday hoping that a letter would come in the mail and start my wizarding journey. Nothing ever came, of course, because my birthday is in January. Then that's not when letters come. I'm assuming the case for this misinterpretation has to do with Harry's own birthday, Born near the end of July, his birthday coincides with the time when other letters are sent out to new witches and wizards across the country. But I do want to explore one other topic related to these letters, and it has to do with the manner in which Harry receives his letters. The first few are obviously thrown away by the Dursleys, but they keep coming and coming and coming to the point where Harry is finally able to snag and read one only to be skirted away to a shack with the Dursleys to avoid any future letters. I do have one other side question about this. Why would the Dursleys go to such lengths to keep Harry away from Hogwarts? If they hated him so much, wouldn't they have loved an opportunity to rid themselves of him in their house, even if it was just for the school year? I'm not sure if this is really ever explained, but it's always been a little confusing to me. 
Maybe they just had a general fear of magic and didn't want to associate in any way, shape, or form. So, back to the letters. Supposedly, Hogwarts is able to magically tell whether a student has opened and read their letter. This apparently accounts for situations where the letter is held hostage for some reason. Though, I would expect that Harry's situation was actually incredibly rare, if not entirely unique. Reason being that when a witch or wizard was born to muggle parents, a special messenger or envoy was sent with the letter to that family. This messenger would explain the entire situation to both the students and the parents. And then presumably the parents would just allow their child to go off to a random magical school, no questions asked. But in the case of the Dursleys, Petunia and presumably Vernon were already aware of the existence of magic. And so no special arrangements were made. The letter was delivered as any other normal mail would be delivered. I guess in situations like Petunia and Lily, this might have occurred before. You have one child, Lily, who becomes a witch, and another child, Petunia, who is a muggle. There must be some resentment that would build over time. How could there not be? I think if I were in this exact situation, I would probably ask my magical relatives to wipe my memory. I don't know if I would want to go on every day knowing that I just missed out on being a wizard. But what do you think? Speaking of arriving to Hogwarts, let's dive a little deeper into the topic in level 3. All Slytherin are bad. Slytherin is easily the most misunderstood house of Hogwarts. The students are often demonized and written off as villains. Every good character in the series is terrified by the prospect of being placed in Slytherin, and in every instance of the movies, they seem to be utterly irredeemable. I mean, in the climactic battle of Hogwarts, they get locked away so they can't interfere. Why does the series treat them this way while also going out of its way to communicate to the reader that not all Slytherin are bad? To me, there are a few things going on here. For starters, the movie series is trying to appeal to an audience, and for that to happen, there needs to be a good guy and a bad guy. In the earlier years of Harry's Hogwarts experience, there isn't really an opportunity for the bad guy to be the big bad guy, Voldemort. He's always present, and he still ends up being the main villain in each movie, but for most of the screen time, it's Harry, Ron, and Hermione dealing with the everyday struggles of being a teenager in school. More often, they end up dealing with Draco Malfoy than they do with Voldemort, at least up until maybe the fourth book, after which it's kind of no holds bar and the villains turn into the kind that actually want to kill you, not just ruin your day or play a prank on you. So every Slytherin we see in the series, which is mostly Draco, Crab, and Goyle, at least as students, are portrayed as villainous people. We're also shown their parents, like Lucius Malfoy, and they too seem to be bad people. This is of course later justified when we see them all as Death Eaters, but that's kind of besides the point. Slytherin is not supposed to be the house villains and terrible people are drawn to. It's supposed to be a house full of students with ambition and hunger for success. In the real world, that might be like the house for people that are going to become CEOs or something. Other traits include cunning, resourcefulness, and leadership. I mean, honestly, even if you consider Harry apart from the Voldemort piece inside of him, he embodies a lot of the values throughout the series that would tie closely with Slytherin. I'm not sure you can make a blanket statement about the entire house unless you think Harry is also bad. Now, we can also acknowledge that the Slytherin house had a pretty dark history. Salazar was obviously one of the founders of the pure blood ideology, one that was eventually picked up and carried forward by Tom Riddle. Another quick aside, in case you never connected the dots, Tom Riddle, Voldemort, was actually not a pure-blood wizard. He was the son of a witch mother and a muggle father, which does make you wonder how he was able to build a cult following around his obsession with pure blood, when he himself lacked it. Anyways, this pure-blood ideology is even admitted by the Sorting Hat to play some role in how students are placed in their first year, which seems problematic to say the least. I'm not sure how someone like Dumbledore would allow that to happen, 
It seems strange that a school would be actively strengthening the pure blood discourse by having a house that was statistically more pure blood than others. But maybe that's all the more reason to be glad we don't live in the wizarding world to begin with. Anyway, as we move on, I'm curious how many of you would sort yourself into Slytherin. Let me know in the comments. I read something recently that apparently the most popular house in the new Harry Potter game is Slytherin. I guess people just can't resist being the bad guy. Harry's cloak is the only one. Harry's invisibility cloak is one of the most memorable parts of the series, and it's something that is with Harry through all seven years of his schooling and beyond. When Harry first unwraps the cloak, Ron tells him, quote, if that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. So what does he mean? Well, we obviously have the hindsight to understand that Harry's cloak is truly a unique object in the wizarding world. Neither Ron nor the reader knows anything about this, though, in the first book. And so Ron ends up being right, but not for the reason he may believe. And this is yet one more prediction made by Ron that comes true. Maybe he is a seer after all. Zeno Lovegood says this about the Cloak of Invisibility. Quote, It is not a traveling cloak imbued with a disillusionment charm or carrying a bedazzling hex or else woven from a demigod's hair, which will hide one initially, but fade with the years until it turns opaque. We are talking about a cloak that really and truly renders the wearer completely invisible and endures eternally, giving constant and impenetrable concealment no matter what spells are cast at it, end quote. We know that Harry's cloak is truly unique, but what are those knockoff cloaks? What was possible with them, and why were they so rare? Well, let's look at the charms that Zeno mentioned, disillusionment charms and bedazzling hexes. First, disillusionment charms. While not the most difficult spell to cast, it seems to have been exceedingly difficult to master. It's shown being taught to fifth-year students ahead of their owls, but none are shown to master its effect. In fact, it's shown that only the most powerful witches and wizards, like Dumbledore and Grindelwald, are capable of mastering the charm, and only complete mastery would grant the user complete invisibility. If you weren't a master, it was more akin to a chameleon, merely blending in with your surroundings. Now, bedazzling hexes, there wasn't really a need to break this one out, as after all the digging I did, they seem to have the same exact effect as a disillusionment charm. I'm not sure that they're really distinct in any way. Let me know in the comments if there is more information out there on these specific hexes. Either way, either avenue you took here, both options seem to wear off over time. And the same goes for the demiguy's hair. On top of that, their disguise seems to be imperfect, meaning that Harry's is truly unique in how well it works. It's also unique in how long it works, which, by all appearances, is indefinitely and eternally. Now let's talk about that durability, though. This is an effect that I'm not sure was ever explored all that much. Certainly not in the movies, but I'm not positive about the books. Zeno says it could provide impenetrable concealment no matter what spells are cast at it. But what does that really mean? Just that casting a spell at the cloak wouldn't damage it, or would it actually protect the wearer from a spell or curse? What if someone randomly cast Avada Kedavra at someone under the cloak? What would happen? There are a couple instances that might shed some light on this. First, there's a scene where, while in hiding, someone attempts to summon the cloak off Harry, which obviously doesn't work. So at the very least, the cloak appears to be immune to summoning-type charms. But what about the user? If we jump ahead to the end of the Half-Blood Prince, we see Harry hiding under the cloak while witnessing Snape kill Dumbledore. Before this happens, Dumbledore casts a binding spell on Harry, stopping him from interfering. So, case closed, right? The cloak doesn't block spells. Well, maybe. But there is one other caveat here, because the wand used to cast that spell was, of course, the Elder Wand. If any wand was able to override the protection of the cloak, it would be the Elder Wand. Finally, this is pure speculation, but I'm curious what you all think. Perhaps because of the nature of the cloak, it's actually capable of stopping one and only one spell, Avada Kedavra. 
A cloak specifically designed to hide from death could have the singular role of stopping actions that bring death to the user. No one ever casts the killing curse at someone hiding under the cloak, so there isn't really any way for us to get the answer, but it really has me thinking. Also, if someone wearing the cloak were to die, what if they fell somewhere that no one would find them? Would their body just be stuck under the cloak forever? Would the cloak essentially be lost forever? How would anyone find the body? Ravenclaw Crest For some reason, this one blew my mind. I think it's a case of just making an assumption early on when I was first reading the books and watching the movies, and then never thinking twice about what I had seen. If I had to ask you, what do you think the symbol for the Ravenclaw house is? What would you say? On the count of three. One, two, three. That's right. An eagle. Surprised? Yeah, so was I. And then I looked a little deeper, only to realize that I wasn't crazy. They did, in fact, change the eagle crest to that of a raven in the film adaptation. If I had to wager, I think this is another case of dumbing down or simplifying the story so that it was easier for the audience to understand. Slytherin sounds like a snake. It's a snake. Gryffindor doesn't really sound like any real animal, except a magical griffin, but that isn't real, so it's easy to accept a lion and that's kind of tied to a griffin anyway. Hufflepuff, I don't know what Hufflepuff is supposed to be, but it's probably, I don't know, I don't know why it's a badger. It sounds more like an owl in my head, but they already had one bird with Ravenclaw, so they couldn't have two. Ravenclaw has the name Raven in it, so I'm guessing they just decided that the combination of the Ravenclaw name plus a bird that wasn't a raven, i.e. an eagle, would be too confusing to audiences. So they changed it. They also changed the colors from blue and bronze in the novels to the blue and silver that appear in the movie. My guess here is that the blue and silver made more sense with a black raven, whereas the bronze would have made a little more sense with that of a brown eagle. One other fun fact I read was that in France, Rowena Ravenclaw was instead named Rowena Serre de Gle. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly in French. But anyway, that translates to eagle's claw. So... If you're a French viewer out there, this one must be extra confusing. Time travel. No iceberg would be complete without at least a passing conversation on the topic of time travel and really all time-related phenomena in the Harry Potter universe. Now, broadly speaking, you can break down most time travel in fictional series into two categories, namely Branching timelines, one where the character's actions in the past create a new branch of reality and affect the present state of that universe. This would be a series like Back to the Future. Changing things in the past changes things in the future. And then we have the second category, which Harry Potter falls into. And that's the closed loop type of time travel. Essentially, everything that is going to happen always happens, and you traveling back in time to change it usually ends up meaning that you're the cause of that present-day state. This is essentially the whole plot of Prisoner of Azkaban. Hermione's time-turner is used to go back and fix things, but they're already fixed when we see them in the first place, so time-traveling doesn't really change anything, it just ensures that events occur in the same way. I think that this is pretty well understood, but I want to talk about something else. Prophecies because I believe they operate in a very similar fashion to time travel in Harry Potter. Of course, not every prophecy comes true, at least not yet. Dumbledore even says as much to Harry, saying, quote, do you think every prophecy in the Hall of Prophecy has been fulfilled? End quote. But my thought is that they likely do come true in one way or another, given a long enough time frame. Fate will arrange itself in a way that will guide individuals down the path of fulfilling a prophecy. In other words, prophecies themselves are actually closed loops, just slightly less determinate. Take, for example, the Chosen One philosophy. I've already touched on this topic, but had Voldemort chosen instead to attack the Longbottoms, Snape would have had no interest in begging pardon on Alice Longbottom's life. There would be no reason for Voldemort to spare Alice Longbottom. But, and this is just my personal opinion, I think fate would have created the circumstances for the Chosen One prophecy's fulfillment. Voldemort would have been prompted in some unexplained way to give either Frank or Alice Longbottom 
a way in which to sacrifice themselves for Neville, setting up the conditions for the sacrificial protection and the bond of blood charm. This idea seems to get me in a lot of trouble with Potterheads, so I'm curious to see the reactions in the comments, so we'll just leave this one where it is and move on to the next. And to get to some truly misunderstood parts of the series, let's go all the way down to level 4. Expelliarmus the Killing Curse I'm about to say the word Expelliarmus like 15 times, so don't get mad if I get it wrong. Let's start with the misconception. At the climax of the series, Voldemort and Harry have one final duel, or rather, they each cast one more spell at each other. Voldemort obviously chooses Avada Kedavra, and Harry goes with his trademark disarming spell, Expelliarmus, which, I don't know, I think is just kind of lame, but Harry's a nerd, so I guess we can let him have it. The two cast their spells, and they meet in the middle. There's the predictable back and forth where we think Harry is going to lose, even though we've all read the final book five years earlier. But of course, the spells get pushed back at Voldemort, and Harry ends up killing him with a disarming spell. Or wait, that's not right, is it? So there are two points. First of all, their spells meeting in the middle, otherwise known as Priori Incantatum, actually only happens once in the series, when Harry's in the graveyard where Voldemort is revived. The example we see at the end of the movies is just that, movie magic. In fact, it doesn't really make any sense, because Harry and Voldemort don't have twin wands at that point. Voldemort is using the Elder Wand, which actually brings us to the main misconception. Expelliarmus is not what kills Voldemort, but I think there's still a distinction to be made here. It's not quite as simple as Voldemort's Avada Kedavra rebounding. In fact, if we look just a chapter or two earlier, we see Voldemort casting the Killing Curse on Harry and succeeding in killing Harry, or at least as far as he knows. Importantly, Harry makes no attempt to defend himself at this point, which in Dumbledore's words appears to have made all the difference. Jump back to the final battle and we see Voldemort again using a wand against its rightful owner in order to kill him. Harry fires off a spell in self-defense, Expelliarmus, and only this time is Voldemort hit with the rebound of his Avada Kedavra. So, does Expelliarmus kill Voldemort? Not exactly, but it does seem to have been a crucial element in forcing his spell to rebound against himself. What this leaves us with is a very interesting question. If Voldemort had been using his own wand, one that he was the rightful owner of, and then cast the killing curse on Harry, what would have happened? At this point, any protection and linkage between the two has been removed. Harry's sacrifice has provided some protection to the students of Hogwarts, in the same way that Lily's provided protection to Harry, but I don't know if that protection extends to Harry himself. So I think that leaves Harry out to dry this time. If Voldemort had just used a different wand, I think his last attempt, even if he was in a very weakened state, probably would have left Harry swimming with the mermaids. That might also make Voldemort the rightful owner of the Elder Wand at that point. And that would have been the makings for a really dark next few books in the series. Good thing Harry really knows how to cast a good Expelliarmus. Quirrell was a Horcrux. I saw this on a pretty popular channel somewhere, and it confused me to the point where I had to do my own research on the topic. Of course, you remember Quirrell, he was our first encounter with the present state disembodied version of Voldemort, hidden underneath a turban on the back of Quirrell's head. But what exactly was Voldemort in this situation? And what was Quirrell? Further, how did that even happen in the first place? Maybe it's just because of how long it's been since the Philosopher's Stone came out, but I figured it was worth a refresher. Come to find out, Quirrell was not actually a bad person prior to his encounter with Voldemort. Was he maybe misunderstood? Yeah. Was he maybe too interested in the dark arts and Voldemort than he should have been? Probably. But that doesn't necessarily make him an evil person, at least not until he was subjugated by Voldemort. Here's Voldemort's description of their meeting. Quote, A wizard, young, foolish, and gullible, wandered across my path in the forest I had made my home. Oh, he seemed the very chance I had been dreaming of, for he was a teacher at Dumbledore's school. He was easy to bend to my will. 
he brought me back to this country, and after a while, I took possession of his body to supervise him closely as he carried out my orders, end quote. So even in his disembodied state, Voldemort was still powerful enough to possess and live on Quirrell's body. So what does that make Quirrell? I think there's a bit of a debate on this topic. Quirrell is obviously hosting a portion of Voldemort's soul, but I'm not sure that qualifies him as a container. In fact, I would say that he clearly isn't a Horcrux, as we can see Harry right next to him as an actual Horcrux. And the effects do not appear to be similar at all. Different sources call Quirrell a temporary Horcrux, but I'm not really sure if it's just semantics at this point, but I do believe that the most important aspect of this is that when Quirrell dies, the piece of Voldemort's soul is not destroyed. It flies off in a puff of smoke, only to be resurrected again in Book 4. I'd argue there is a distinction to be made between a Horcrux and whatever happened to Quirrell. I don't think Voldemort even met the requirements to make a Horcrux when he possesses Professor Quirrell, the least of which, to my understanding, involves a murder something we're not really told about when he possesses Quirrell. This is probably another nitpicky distinction that I should probably just leave alone, but Horcruxes did not appear to be made flippantly, and Voldemort didn't split his soul again to possess Quirrell. So my answer is that no, Quirrell was not a Horcrux, he was just possessed. I think that's important because the number of Horcruxes is tied directly to the number of pieces of Voldemort's soul, and that possession of Quirrell doesn't make another piece. It's just the same piece that left the Potter's house all those years earlier. Splits in Voldemort's soul. This is a quick one, but it came up as I was looking into the Quirrell question. Exactly how many pieces of Voldemort existed? The confusion arises from the difference between the number of Horcruxes and the number of times that he split his soul. So, we had the diary, the ring, the locket, the diadem, the cup, the potter boy, and the guinea. That makes seven, count them, seven horcruxes, each containing a piece of Voldemort's soul. But that isn't everything, because how else would he have come back? You see, there is the tricky to spot eighth piece of his soul that exists flying around as an amorphous smoke monster after his Bell backfires at the Potter's house. On top of the counting aspect, the confusion, I believe, is caused by the fact that when Voldemort dies at the Potter's, that part of his soul is not destroyed. Rather, it flees the scene, escaping to the forests of Albania, where Quirrell and then Wormtail eventually find him. So, there are in fact eight pieces of Voldemort's soul which does raise the interesting question of whether he doomed himself by creating eight pieces as opposed to seven. The Harry Potter world often gives magical powers, or ties significance to certain numbers, as being more magical than others. Specifically, the number seven is supposed to be the most magical number. How exactly would that manifest? Would it just mean that his horcruxes would lend his main body more power or something? There probably isn't a concrete answer to this, but I do wonder if it would have somehow changed the narrative. Clearly, there isn't an advantage to just continuing to make horcruxes. Your soul would become too divided. Otherwise, Voldemort would have easily made dozens or hundreds of them. And just making one horcrux wasn't enough to satisfy his thirst for immortality, or maybe avoid his fear of death. And maybe Seven really would have been the magic ticket and we all would have been reading a very different story. Polyjuice potions don't affect the voice. Honestly, I could probably make an entire video about changes that were made to the Harry Potter series when they were adapted from novel to film. This appears to be yet another example of a movie-exclusive change, but I'm not totally sure why they would have done this. My best guess is that they thought this added challenge of having to match the voice of whoever was being impersonated would be a lighthearted and funny change. And it was, so I don't really fault the showrunners. I don't think it necessarily takes away anything from the story, it just adds a layer of complexity to what might have been an otherwise overpowered potion. In reality, 
The Polyjuice Potion and its effects are much more effective than that of the potion we see in the movies. Typically, the potion in the movies is used as comic relief, from Hermione turning into a cat by accident, to having to impersonate Crabbe and Goyle, all the way to the Battle of Seven Potters, and all the fun outfits we get to see Daniel Radcliffe wearing. All these instances are somewhat lighthearted. Minus, of course, the fact that the Battle of Seven Potters is where we see Hedwig murdered, and also Mad-Eye Moody. The real Polyjuice Potion creates an almost exact replica of the intended target. Worth noting that a Polyjuice Potion would not be able to manipulate or fool the Marauder's Map, nor would it allow someone to bypass some of the defenses at Gringotts. So, it was probably a good call to scale back the effects of the Polyjuice Potion for the movies, but for the sticklers and potterheads out there, you're justified in knowing that voices are in fact affected by the Polyjuice Potion. The Effects of the Resurrection Stone Possibly the most misunderstood piece out of all seven books in the original series. Lying at the center of a confusing web of different forms of resurrection, immortality, death, and limbo, is the Resurrection Stone. Originally described as being created by death himself, and having the ability to, quote, recall loved ones from death. The stone starts as a part of a ring that became one of Voldemort's horcruxes, which was then destroyed by Dumbledore. It then eventually finds its way into the center of a golden snitch, Harry's first snitch he ever caught, with his mouth. The words, I open at the close, are engraved on the side, indicating to Harry, even just hinting, at what was about to happen. I'm not sure how Dumbledore enchanted the snitch to open once Harry had accepted death. Would it have opened if he just told the snitch that he was ready to die, or did he actually have to be in mortal danger? Anyway, regardless of how the snitch opens, it reveals the resurrection stone inside, and with it, a chance for Harry to see his loved ones again. Harry describes these appearances of his loved ones as similar to that of Tom Riddle in the Chamber of Secrets. They are more present than that of a ghost, but not fully present, and they don't have a solid body. I think there's some tricky wordplay happening here. The Resurrection Stone specifically is claimed to allow the user to recall their loved ones. One might interpret that as bringing them back to the mortal realm, recalling them into existence, as one might have a recall on their car. But the other interpretation would be that recall is actually synonymous with the word remember in this situation. This seems to be the more likely option, as the friends and family floating around Harry clarify that only Harry can see them. In other words, it's all happening in Harry's head, a memory. So, and now that we've clarified what the Resurrection Stone actually does, let's skip to the part where Harry is killed and then comes back to life. Many fans seem to have assumed along the way, partly because of the confusing narrative around the Deathly Hallows, that the Resurrection Stone is what brings Harry back to life. There's one problem with this, though. Harry doesn't even have the stone when he's killed. He drops it before then, intentionally losing it on the forest floor amongst millions of other tiny little stones, never to be found again, or at least not anytime soon. I suppose that one argument you could make is that the Resurrection Stone was instrumental in getting Harry to accept his death, which according to Dumbledore was the reason that he found himself in limbo in the first place, that his willing sacrifice was what made all the difference. So in a way, the stone did encourage him to make a sacrifice, but that still isn't the real reason that Harry was able to return to life. The true reason is that because Voldemort had Harry's blood in his veins, Harry used that blood and the lingering effects of Lily's sacrificial magic to return to Earth. Voldemort essentially acted as a horcrux for Harry, in a way. Just instead of a piece of his soul, it was the remaining love from his mother that brought him back. In the end, the Resurrection Stone had absolutely nothing to do with it. It may have been instrumental in extending that protection to the students of Hogwarts, but it's not what brought Harry back to life. And with that, we've made it to the end. Hopefully there were a few in here that were a surprise to you, or will inspire a healthy debate in the comments. I think the debate is one of the funnest parts of diving into this lore, 
so I'll be keeping an eye on them. If you've made it this far and haven't clicked the subscribe button, please do. It helps the channel grow and supports me so that I can make more content for you. Lastly, this channel isn't only Harry Potter content. I'm making other videos about other series, and I've got videos on the channel about Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Avatar The Last Airbender, even Pokemon. I even have a few videos talking about big corporate fraud and other non-fiction topics. Check them out. But with that, I'll leave you to it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.